Hello. Um, whew. A little bit frazzled today because I'm trying to squeeze this in amongst lots of other teaching stuff I've got to do. But what I thought we'd do is we do an introduction to the nervous system as a whole, the anatomy of the nervous system. Um, so we'll talk about a neuron and then from there, we'll, I guess we'll start at the top and we'll work our way down and out. And the main aim will be to cover the major terms, the major structures. So when you come across them elsewhere, you know what people mean when they say spinal nerve, medulla oblongata and things like that, okay? And I'm gonna be really careful to not go into too much detail. So this isn't gonna be detailed, this is gonna be introductory. There's other detailed stuff to go and look at, all right? Right. Um, pipe clean. So, uh, pipe clean, that's an idea. We use pipe cleaners for um, making things and poking skulls and that sort of thing. But if we're to consider a neuron, a neuron then is the basic cell of the nervous system and a neuron has a, you know, they're, they're, there are various types of essentially, if you think about a neuron as having a cell body at one end, all right, so the nucleus and it's got a little bit of a fat bit there, the cell body is at one end, and then it sends off a long axon to somewhere else in the body, and that may be very, very long. It might be more than a meter in you. It might be many meters long in a blue whale. So these are incredibly long cells. But a neuron sends an axon down to meet another neuron, or uh, to become a receptor for something, or motor to something like trigger a muscle contraction or something like that. And that is what the nervous system is largely made up of, and that is the cell and the shape you should be thinking about when we're thinking about the wiring of the central nervous system, the neuron. There are other cells in the nervous system, there are lots of supportive cells and connected tissue cells and fat producing cells and all sorts of other cells, but functionally, that's our that's our guy, all right? So when we talk about gray matter and white matter, the gray matter, those are collections of nerve cell bodies. So the cell body, the neuron cell body there. Uh, and they, so for example, in the brain, the gray matter is around the outside. It's more superficial. And the white matter, when we're talking about white matter, we're talking about axons covered in myelin, fat, which is why they look white. So nerves, again, when we look at, when we think about nerves, they are bundles of neuron axons, generally covered in, in myelin. So gray matter and white matter. Um, the brain, or the brain, as many students seem to spell it in some anatomy exams. The brain has a number of lobes and we can see these sulci and gyri, uh, the gyri being the the fold and the sulky being the, the depression, which give a lot more surface area to the brain, so a lot more room for grey matter, so a lot more room for more neurons, more neurons, more connections, more complexity. Um, and it has a number of lobes. We have the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe, and these are all parts of the cerebrum. And there are two cerebral hemispheres, left and right, split down the middle, but joined by big tracts of white matter, so they do communicate. So that, those are the cerebral hemispheres. This is the cerebrum. And then, uh, coming out of the cerebrum, descending down here, we have, well, in the center there, we have the midbrain, which we can't really see. It's surrounded by the rest of the cerebral hemispheres up here. And then we have the, the pons. It's curved like a bridge, pons, pont. So we have the pons and the medulla or the medulla oblongata. And then the medulla oblongata continues as the spinal cord descending down through the back. So that's the brain stem. The midbrain, pons and medulla comprise what we call the brain stem. And we can see a number of nerves coming out of the brain stem and indeed coming out of the, the cerebrum. And these nerves we call cranial nerves because they come out of these parts. If we spin around posteriorly, we see these chunks of tissue here. These are the, or well, this is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, I'm keeping it simple, let's not talk about functions, we're just talking about names. So the cerebellum 
is attached to the brain stem. Boom. Okay, so then spinal cord. So then the spinal cord is a continuation from the medulla oblongata through the vertebrae all the way down the back. I say all the way down the back. In adults, the spinal cord is not the same length as the vertebral column. So the spinal cord actually ends here. And what we can see here are spinal nerves running down, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but that's the central nervous system. So the, the cerebrum, the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord are the central nervous system, which is commonly abbreviated to CNS. The other division of the nervous system is the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. Now, the peripheral nervous system is everything that comes out of the central nervous system. So here we see spinal nerves coming off regularly and other nerves. That's, those are all parts of the peripheral nervous system. And those cranial nerves that we see here are also parts of the peripheral nervous system. All right. So what's a spinal nerve then? Well, um, a spinal nerve is a nerve that leaves the spinal cord and um, passes off to somewhere else in the body. Now we've talked about all of these things in more detail elsewhere, so I'll leave that to those videos. But remember our basic building block of the neuron. A spinal nerve then is a collection of lots and lots of neurons. Some of them are sensory and some of them are motor. And they're all bundled together. And the reason they're running together as a spinal nerve really is because they're all going to a similar location. We're a segmented animal, and we can see that these spinal nerves are showing us those segments. Those segments are most obvious in the rib cage, but they continue elsewhere throughout the body. Uh, and sometimes those, those spinal nerves come together. So these are, this is the brachial plexus forming up here. These are the nerves that are going to supply the upper limb. We can see these spinal nerve roots coming together very soon after they leave to form new nerves because by coming together they're forming you know new structures anatomists like to name everything so we'll give those new names and then they change and link and change and blend and join and, and eventually form the major nerves of the upper limb and the plexus then a plexus is um it's like an organization of wires it's like wiring the the the, the nerves are all crossing over and joining and forming new nerves but there aren't any connections in there it's just cabling it's just cable management that's a plexus. Whereas a ganglion, which is what we're seeing here, a ganglion is a collection of neuron cell bodies outside the central nervous system. We would call, I said that gray matter is uh, collections of nerve cell bodies, but a ganglion, this mass that we can see here, if we see a ganglion inside the central nervous system, it, it tends to be called a nucleus. But a nucleus inside the central nervous system is again just a collection of nerve cell bodies. See, terminology is one of the first things that can trip you up when you're trying to learn neuroanatomy. And neuroanatomy is hard enough as it is. So um, the spinal cord descends and gives off a number of spinal nerves and those run off to their target, audience, uh, target organs and tissues and what have you, bam, job done. They might be innovating muscles and causing them to contract. They might be carrying all sorts of sensory information back. Uh, and there are, there are maybe one or two connections between that nerve and the central nervous system before they get to the higher centers. But as I said, that's all covered elsewhere. Um, so we were talking about the spinal cord. There is another video about the spinal cord, um, but the spinal cord only reaches this far and then all these spinal nerves that you see leaving the vertebral column at regular intervals when we get down here into the so we're into the lumbar region and the sacral region those spinal nerves just carry on running down inside the vertebrae and then leave a little bit later so if you were just to look at the spinal nerves leaving the vertebrae it remains this nice, neat, segmented pattern that you would expect to see. It's only when you look inside the vertebrae that you see that, in fact, the spinal cord has ended here and the spinal nerves are forming like a horse's tail, the cord of equina down here. Um, that's almost it, isn't it? Because not only do we divide the nervous system into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, but we also divide it into autonomic and somatic. Now, somatic, soma, 
soma meaning the body. So the somatic nervous system means of the body. And essentially, it's, um, so the somatic nervous system is involved with things you can, things you can con consciously control and things that you are consciously aware of. The best examples are of are this. So somatic motor control is I'm deciding to make these movements and I'm making them. So that's um, the somatic nervous system that's controlling my skeletal muscles. And um, when I poke my skin, when I get stung by a bee, uh, when a wasp, uh, when a fly flies into my eye, um, those are things I'm very consciously aware of. So that, those are, that would be the sensory side of the somatic nervous system, so of the body, do you see what I mean? Whereas the autonomic nervous system is involved with things that we're not consciously aware of. If we think of a motor example, the autonomic nervous system would um, be involved in controlling the muscles in the GI tract that pass your food along the tube. You really don't want to be aware of that. You don't want to have to think about where something is and then move it along. No, 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 no. That's what the autonomic nervous system does. It's automatically looking after your GI tract for you. you. You're not even aware of it. You can't be aware of it unless you have some pain or something. Um, so then the sensory side of that, of the autonomic nervous system, um, again, would be carrying sensory things back from the gut. But another good example would be um, blood pressure and um, blood gas, um, blood gas levels. So in some of the major blood vessels in the body and deep inside the brain, there are baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. And those baroreceptors are looking at the stretch in artery muscle walls so they can they can look at the, the the blood pressure in that blood vessel and chemoreceptors are looking at the chemical composition of the blood and sending that information back to the brain so the brain is aware of how it needs to mod mod modulate the blood vessels in the body and the heart to manage blood pressure and to make you breathe in faster or slower to make sure um, the chemical composition of the blood in terms of oxygen and carbon dioxide and what have you is appropriate. Do you see what I mean? So the autonomic nervous system has a sensory function in monitoring your body and making sure it is as it should be and then autonomically changing things to make sure we have this level of homeostasis to make sure things are as they should be. So that's the autonomic nervous system. But what about physically? Well, somatic... OK, so um, I was talking about the brachial plexus. Most of the nerves of the brachial plexus are innervating skeletal muscles of the upper limb and carrying sensory innervation back from the skin of the upper limb. So these nerves are very big because they have a large number of neurons. It's a physical thing. If you have greater sensitivity in your fingertips, you need more sensory neurons. More sensory neurons means that nerve gets bigger. So the brachial plexus might be a really good example of of, of, of a section of the somatic nervous system. Now, most of these spinal nerves will in fact be mixed. They'll have autonomic fibres and somatic fibres in there because in your skin, um, you are autonomically controlling blood flow to your skin when you're hot, more blood flows to your skin, you lose heat. And when you're cold, less blood flows to your skin. And you, yeah, that's all under autonomic control. That's the smooth muscle in the arterioles being controlled there. Also, the hair sticks up and, and so on, right? So throughout your body, particularly the skin and elsewhere, but most of these nerves, most of the nerves in the body are mixed and are carrying autonomic nerves and somatic nerves. So it's not an easy physical distinction to make. It's more of a, a thoughtful distinction. Um, but we can see some autonomic structures. So this here, these ganglia, ganglia this is the um, sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain or sympathetic ganglia. And what these are, are, okay, so the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the nervous system are both parts of the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system gets divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. And all sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons are motor, they're all driving something. And then you'll have visceral sensory fibres coming back, visceral afferents, which would be part of the autonomic system, really. They're the sensory part. 
So the sympathetic nervous system, and there's a whole video on this, I'm sure, it originates in a section of the spinal cord. It sends a neuron out to a sympathetic ganglion. It meets another neuron there because, of course, a ganglion is a cell body sending out another axon. Boom, boom. So we have a collection of sympathetic nerve cell bodies here. And then the sympathetic neuron from the ganglion runs out with another nerve usually to get to wherever it's got to go. So the sympathetic nervous system comes out of the spinal cord. The parasympathetic nervous system is described as craniosacral. Craniosacral. So this is the sacrum down here. And that's because um, parasympathetic neurons that are driving parasympathetic things come out of the brain. The vagus nerve is the, probably the biggest and most famous one. And the vagus nerve carries parasympathetic fibres from the brain down through the body to your GI tract, your abdomen and, and what have you. But it doesn't reach all the way down to your pelvis, so there are also some, some sacral parasympathetic neurons in the spinal cord that come out of the sacral vertebrae and carry parasympathetic innervation to the pelvis and what have you. So, sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation is largely to organs. And you may well know this already, but they get described in two different ways. So the sympathetic nervous system is described as your fight or flight response because it's, um, well, it's, it's involved with adrenaline and it can also result in a release of adrenaline into the blood, which triggers all of your sympathetic stuff. So the fight or flight response gets you ready to flee. It fires up all your muscles, releases a whole bunch of energy, gets you, gets you like super powered, ready to run or to fight. So it's a survival thing. Whereas the parasympathetic division of the nervous system is kind of the opposite. It's described as rest and digest. So the parasympathetic nervous system is largely driving, for example, your gastrointestinal tract. So you have a meal and it drives all of those functions. And in many parts of the body, they kind of work in opposition. You know, like they'll both, both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers will run to the heart and will affect the rate at which the heart beats and the force of contraction of the heart. And that's quite a good example of them working in opposition. One will speed your heart up, one will slow it down. You can probably work out which is which. But in other areas of the body, they don't always work in opposition. It's, it's a little bit more um, complicated than that. How's that? I think I've achieved what I set out to do, which was to give an overview of the anatomy of the nervous system. So what we wanted to do was be able to identify the parts of the brain and the parts of the central nervous system and know what those terms meant so we can recognise the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebellum, um, the midbrain, the pons and the medulla, and then the spinal cord. Uh, we've talked about cranial nerves and spinal nerves, and we've split the nervous system into somatic and autonomic, and we've talked about some of those structures, and then we've talked about how we divide the autonomic nervous system into sympathetic and parasympathetic. That's a really good starting point. Um, I mean, I, I don't find neuroanatomy easy. And what I try to do when we're teaching students here, because some are very good and some are not very good, and some, you know, as they find it difficult. What I'm trying to do is just try and get everybody up to the same level. And then when we're all on that same level, we can add detail and add detail and add detail slowly. But if you don't get up to that initial level, the rest of it just gets really patchy. All right. Right, I better go do, get ready for my next thing. So I'll see you guys next week.